Amen, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We give God the glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. If you'll open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 15. And 16. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I feel good. I feel, I feel like the Lord is here. I feel like I don't need to be in a hurry tonight. I know it's a little late, but we've got time to worship God. The Bible reads as follows. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. And hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. Praise the Lord. My subject for tonight, as you can see on the screens, is unbroken succession. I want you to pray for me. For quite some time, the Lord has been speaking to my heart. And I want to I want to give you what the Lord has given me. On December the 12th, 1980, during a general appointees or a general overseer staff meeting, something was said by our present general overseer that really aroused a, a serious curiosity in me. This created in me the inspiration for this message. During the course of that meeting, the general overseer gave out his instructions about the work. Several subjects were touched upon that were very important and relevant to the church work. We all listened with intent interest. The general overseer spoke to us from his heart, as he always does. There was something that Bishop Tomlinson did during that meeting which was most significant to me. He gave each of us a booklet entitled Answering the Call of God. This booklet was given to each of us. He presented it. The request that we read it carefully. The purpose was, as he put it, to help us remember our heritage. We must not forget where we came from and who we are, were his very words. His request was most sincere and very serious. The seriousness of his request was known when one of the men present said, Sir, I've already read this book. The general overseer quickly replied and said, I want you to read it again. As if that was not enough, and to stress the importance of the matter, he went a, a step farther and said, And when you've read the book, come to my office and tell me that you've read it. You know he wasn't playing. Of course, everyone, including me, we complied. I'm sure we all did. As a matter of fact, I went to his office and took my book, my booklet, and I had him autograph it. 
and I lost it someplace. Somebody's got the General Overseer's autograph on my little booklet. But it was, it was very important to me what he did that day. Now, as I said before, this really did something to me. It made me think about matters that have been a serious concern to me regarding the church and her unique message. You have to excuse me, I got to make myself at home. Thank you. It made me think about the church. It made me think about her unique message. The general overseer's desire and wish was for the church and her glorious message to remain alive and to continue. This he said, is to help us remember our heritage. That's what, those were his very words. Now, brethren, continue means something that keeps on going on in succession uninterruptedly. Continuity is the state or quality of being continuous or unbroken. It applies to that which extends without interruptions in either space or time. And that's what I think the general overseer wanted from uh, from uh, wanted us to get as a message that he was concerned that the church's message would continue on. Now, heritage is something handed down from one ancestor or from our past, such as a character, a culture, or a tradition. It is something to be passed on to the oncoming generations. The heritage that we have in the church is to be treasured and guarded with utmost care and interest. We have something which is holy and divine in nature, which makes it so much more valuable. That which comes from God should be guarded and cared for and kept alive with all diligence. We humans strive to keep our family name and our ancestral traditions alive and continual. Recently, I sat down with my father and I asked him to fill me in on some of our, on our fellow family and, and relations because I knew very little about them. I wrote down the names of our ancestors and I noted some prominent features and some family traits and I took all of this down because it was important to me. These type of things are important to all of us. We should all be interested in knowing our beginnings so that we may be able to pass them on to the generations to come. What my father has passed on to me, I want to pass on to my son. And I want my son to pass them on to his children. I have an old guitar. It's a Martin guitar that my father bought when I was about eight years old. When my son was, I believe, 15 years old, I said, son, this is a family tre treasure. And it is going to be yours so that you can pass it on to your children. And I felt really wonderful about that. But that is, that is some of the material things that we deal with. We are concerned with all of that. We should be interested in that. There are examples in the Bible of how the patriarchs of old diligently took measures to preserve the birthrights and privileges given by God. There are several examples in the scriptures, such as the one found in Genesis 24, 1 and 3, and verses 7 and 8, 
Abraham was old and well stricken in age and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things and Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had put I pray thee the hand under my thigh and I will make thee swear by the Lord the God of heaven and the God of the earth that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell the Lord God of heaven which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which speak unto me and that swear unto me saying unto thy seed will I give this land he shall send his angels before thee and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence and if the woman will not be willing to follow thee then thou shalt be clear from this my oath only bring not my son thither again two important things to notice one of them is that Abraham insisted that his son should not marry and become mixed up with the Canaanites. The Canaanites represented in this message the world. Secondly, the servant was to be sure that under no circumstances should the son return to the old place from where they had been brought out of. Abraham said, beware thou that thou bring not my son thither again amen, amen. there was a divine heritage that Abraham as a patriarch wanted to preserve he required and warned that there should not be a mixing with the world and that and that once God had led us out of the world we should not go back we as church having been brought out of the world of denominationalism should not go back there seems to be a certain unrest in some that causes them to look back and desire to return to those practices. Some even have the audacity to venture into the world of autonomy and self-rule, defying the authority of those over them in the Lord. They reach for the fellowship and companionship and mixture of the old world and its ambitions a mixture that will not be tolerated by the spirit who was sent by the spirit of God who was sent to present the church a chaste and pure virgin hallelujah pray for me got a lot to say here that great spirit which is leading the church to that great and glorious encounter with the husband will make sure that she the church will be exactly what the father wants for his son Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. hallelujah individually men may stray from the church however the church as a whole will walk on towards her encounter with her beloved the preservation of the heritage of God must be attributed to the men of God who were in leadership positions. These men such as Abraham, Moses, Joshua, David and others were men who paralleled in their deep-rooted convictions and clear vision of what God wanted for his people. I've already mentioned about Abraham and his stern instructions. Moses was concerned with continuity when he spoke to Joshua saying be strong and of good courage fear not and nor be afraid of them for the Lord thy God is he that doeth he it is that doeth go with thee and he will not fall fail thee nor forsake thee and Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel be strong and of good courage for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them and thou shalt cause them to inherit it thou shalt cause them to inherit it and the Lord he it is that doth go before thee he will be with thee he will not fail thee 
neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. God too was concerned about the continuity of his chosen people. And he spoke to Joshua again saying, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, but that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Hearing all of this, Joshua spoke up, and he declared his allegiance to him whom had called him. It is clearly stated in Joshua 24, verse 14 and 15. He stood up and said, Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seemed evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. King David also displays his interest in the preservation of things that he knew God wanted for his people. You can read this in 1 Chronicles 28, verses 9 and 10. He spoke to his son Solomon, who indeed represented the new generation that was coming on. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father. Serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. King David pr proceeded to show his son the pattern of the house. These men of prominent leadership were concerned with the unbroken succession of God's work and program. Succeeding generations have difficulty in maintaining an equal perspective of the preceding generations. We're able to see this in the church, in the wilderness. Joshua and most of his generation were faithful to God and kept all the words of the Lord because he and his generation physically saw the works of God as they sojourned towards the promised land. This is why he was interested in erecting the markers as God ordered. These were to be reminders so that they would not forget and thus be able to convey to their children what God did for them. The next generation served the Lord having heard all that God did for their fathers. But this generation was not completely submissive to God. God asked them to destroy the nations, customs and traditions of the world, but in many cases they did not obey. In fact, this generation tolerated the other nations and their false gods. They even went so far as to enter into covenants and agreements with them. This action caused God to be angry with them and to leave them. The third generation knew not God. What their parents tolerated and commingled with, admitting their false gods and even worshiping them became their way of life. Tragically, they lost that wonderful heritage and became estranged to it. This situation must not be repeated in the church of today. This shall not happen again. The key to the prevention of this tragedy will be concerned leadership. Let me say that again. The key to the prevention of this tragedy will be concerned leadership. The church needs and is looking for a strong leadership, spiritual and zealous for God. Brother Ron Ham told me a story of something he heard in a meeting that he attended of a denomination. He said he heard they were discussing their situation and he said they, 
that they said the problem with the lack of growth in our organization is that we are now being led by a third and fourth generation people. They neither have the zeal of the founding fathers nor the torch that was passed from the first generation to the second. They are faced with the duties and administration and administrating an institution they did not give birth to nor nourishment. They have inherited not only the financial responsibility but also the attitudes that have evolved over the years. Their inspiration for leading the institution comes from their own interpretations of what its original mission was. They lean to their own understanding. They are content to institutionalize that organization. I'm telling you here tonight, that must never be said of the Church of the Living God. There must be unbroken succession from generation to generation. Hallelujah! There must not be a generation gap. Not now nor in the future. Hallelujah! The vision of the church must continue brightly. Hallelujah! Before our children so that they may be aware and carry on with the church. If the ministry maintains a sharp focus on the church, if our present day leadership has a vision of the church, our children too will certainly catch that vision. Hallelujah. And if they don't have it, they will certainly desire it and pray for divine revelation. We must not fail our upcoming generations. This present day generation of leadership must exemplify the church and share our heritage with our children. They want to know. Our children want to know. Hallelujah. They want to pick up the tradition and carry on the work. There are many questions about our leadership. There is great concern about some of our leaders. Some of our ministerial personalities today are striving to graduate or to ascend to the status of a celebrity. They're seeking fame and popularity. Others are satisfied to become great managers and administrators instead of compassionate shepherds of the flock. And that's distressing to me. Hallelujah. After losing, after having lost the vision of the divine church, some are not content in leaving themselves and being lost, but they seek to confuse and derail their total congregations from the body of Christ. But you know I'm preaching the truth. This erring trend of spirituality, of spiritual vagrancy, must not be permitted or tolerated in the church. We can't have that. The spiritual, the spirit of, of, of going here and there and seeking their own self-interests must be done away with in the church of God. We must not return to the place from where God has brought us out of. Auto autonomy and self-rule, which are consistently idiosyncratic to the denominational Christendom, are contrary to theocracy. I'll say that again. Autonomy and self-rule are consistently are the idiosyncrasies of the denominational Christians. But this is contrary to theocracy. There's no self-rule in theocracy. God rules. God rules. God rules, God rules in the church. Hallelujah. The church must hold fast to the biblical traditions which we have been taught. It troubles me. It troubles me as I travel to many places when I hear people say in our church they hardly ever preach on the teachings 
We don't know. They don't know what the 29 important Bible truths are. I know this is not our creed. The whole Bible we take rightly divided. I know that. But all these have been, been approved by the General Assembly under the Holy Ghost guidance, hallelujah, for the church. But yet, years go on. And our members never hear a message on these teachings. And another thing, advice to members. Many people say, it's an advice, I can take it or leave it. I'll tell you what, you better take it. And what's more, you better as a pastor teach your congregation about the advice to members. The wise counsel of the General Assembly is to be taken into consideration. Glory to God. I have such deep respect for the General Assembly Accords. I wouldn't dare take the audacity to, to break any one of the recommendations of the General Assembly. And it troubles me when I hear that ministers and leaders have the General Assembly rulings as light things not to be taken seriously. No wonder our kids don't know enough about the assemblies. I have such respect for the General Assembly. I wish that our, I wish that our assemblies were held during the summer months when our children could come to the assembly. Our kids are growing up and they don't know what the General Assembly is all about. I don't know. I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm completely right. But oh God, we need to keep our kids involved. They are the generation that's coming on. They will carry the torch onward. Hallelujah. The Bible rightly divided. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. I'll tell you what. There's some people who will say that they, they don't like it. That we can't preach anything that hasn't been approved by the General Assembly. And, and, the, and the questions and subjects committee. And the doctrine committee. But I have a whole lot of respect for the doctrine committee of the church. This is the wise counsel, hallelujah, that God has operating today. Hallelujah. If we lose our respect for that committee and their function in the church, then people will do whatever they feel is right and not necessarily divide the word of God like God wants it. Many people are doing this and something is happening to them. The more they, the more they, they become uh, defensive against the church and its teachings and its traditions and, 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 and its rulings, the farther they get from the fellowship of the total church. The Bible clearly talks about this. Listen to this. Proverbs 21, 16 says, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you like this kind of preaching or not, but it's burning up in my heart. It troubles me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I think that we need to stay in the congregation of the living. Hallelujah. We need to abide. Hallelujah. In the shelter of the Almighty. In His glorious church. It admonishes in Jeremiah 2.36. And it says, Why gaddest thou about? 
so much to change thy ways. Seems to be an itch. There seems to be an itch in people today. The old fashioned preaching. Come on. The old fashioned gospel preaching. That word of God is not enough. We've got to go and consult with the theologians of the world. The general assembly rulings are not enough. The council of the, of the doctrine committee is not enough. No, the questions and subjects committee, they don't know they have all of it. So we've got to ask the theologians of the world. Praise God, I'm here to tell you, some of those theologians that people refer to in their books and stuff are not even saved. I mean by the standards of the Bible. And you hear them quoted in the pulpit. Hallelujah. Much more than you hear the Bible. But I'm here to tell you, we are the body of Christ, the church of the living God. We are peculiar. We are strange. We are different. Hallelujah. We are not like the world. The church of God must have steadfast leaders. It is imperative that we become concerned. The leadership must be spiritual and filled with a vision and divine revelation. Let me read that again. Because it looks like and it seems like a lot of our leadership, not all of it, but some of our leadership, they, they, they lack divine revelation of the church, of the Bible. And so few times is this glorious message of God and His church is preached in our pulpits. So many times they make you think like, well, there's nothing to that. You can't get people saved. There are no miracles happen. There's no, when you preach the church, you have to, you have to just... It's just, a, just a, a dull message that only interests a few. But I'm here to tell you, that is a wrong spirit. I have seen more things happen in the days when I have preached messages on the church than when I have preached an evangelistic message. Let me give you an example. I went to the convention in Brazil. Here's the overseas city right here. I went to his convention this year in June. Oh... Whew. The glory of the Lord was in that house. Oh, Brother Felipe, I'll never forget that convention. Friday night, it was like, I just, I don't know how to explain it. The Lord was right there. It was glorious. The altar filled. I preached a message on the church. The altar just filled with souls seeking God souls being saved sanctified and then there was a prayer line started and the healing line come on we laid hands on them many many were healed is that right brother Felipe many were healed they walked on through that healing line Some, a message on the church had nothing to do with divine healing but God honors his word and so I never will forget what happened that night. There was a young father who had a baby in his arms. He, he said, as he come to the line, he said, pray for my baby. We brought this baby to be healed. And I thought to myself, oh God, you got to heal this baby. These people come from a long way. And this man was crying. His tears bathed his face and dripped on down to his blue shirt. And just made long streamers down. And I watched him. We laid hands on that baby. And he walked on through the line. And he went out into the crowd. Many people were healed. But his baby was not healed. The second night, Brother Felipe preached. He, he stood up to read his annual address. And you know how overseers do. They prepare a wonderful annual address. He had the same thing done. But the Holy Ghost got a hold of him. And he preached. Oh God, did that man preach? 
Oh, the glory of the Lord was in that house. The place turned into a total altar. Souls everywhere. He preached on the church. A message on the church. And now God blessed the people were all over that place. This is a big Baptist, big Baptist auditorium. And oh, how God bless. That night, the message was so powerful that an Assembly of God minister that was present said, I want to join the church before I leave home. Is that right, Brother Felipe? He stood up and he took the covenant and our local church in Belo Horizonte took him in and gave him the right hand of fellowship. You should have been there. It was marvelous. Wonderful. Yeah. Praise God. And again the prayer line started when we laid hands on the sick. And the father again brings his baby. And he says, Brother Garcia, we brought this baby to be healed. And I know God's going to heal him, heal her. And so his crying just tore my heart up. He just cried with such intensity. His tears run down his face. But oh, we laid hands on that baby. And God just, well, I don't know. He held up his healing. But he walked on through. And then the line. Other people were healed. Many others were healed that Saturday night. Sunday, I was on to preach again. Sunday, I was, the convention was supposed to end at 12 noon. I think it ended about 4.30 or something like that. Because we had a mighty, mighty move of God. You should have been there. And I got up to preach, and I preached a message on the church. It was something that God had just inspired me right there at the pulpit. I don't believe I opened my Bible once. And it just, just looked like that flow kept on coming. And I preached and preached. It's kind of like it was at Presho, uh, South Dakota the other day. And how God blessed us there. I don't think I opened my Bible there either, did I, Brother Ham? But oh God, He blessed. That place, something happened. Towards the, uh, the Lord just closed the message with an explosion. It was like an explosion. Like the wind suddenly blew. And God began to pour out His Spirit. Everyone in the house were on their knees. And God was bathing us with His glory. Hallelujah. Oh, how God blessed. That day, two ministers that were from denominations decided or determined that day to join the church. Make a long story short, the prayer line started again. Now, we didn't call for a prayer line, but it starts awful easy. And this time the mother had this baby in her hands. She had the baby face up in her arms. She had her like this. She said, Bishop Garcia, we brought this baby to be healed. Brother Felipe had the bottle of oil and he was anointing. And uh, this baby's little legs dangled down her mother's arms. Just a tiny two-year-old baby. And their legs were dangling down. When we, I, I was moved to compassion. Everyone was moved to compassion. I started saying, oh God, this is the last chance, Lord. Please do something for these people. I, I took this baby's legs in my hands. And when we were praying... I felt a tremor in her legs. I don't know how to explain that to you. And I don't know what made it significant to me at the moment because I didn't know what was wrong with that child. But her legs trembled in my hands. And I felt chills go up and down all over me. And we prayed and she walked out. Out through the crowd and on outside into the courtyard. My eyes were on her. I expected God to do something. But I didn't see her no more. She walked out of the building, down some flights of stairs, on down to a foyer. When she got to the foyer, this baby began to squirm in her arms, trying to get out of her arms. And she knew she couldn't turn this baby loose. And it squirmed and squirmed until it dropped to the ground. And when it dropped to the ground, they said she gave, she stretched her arms to pick her up. And the baby grabbed her hands and pulled herself and stood up. Praise God. Hallelujah. The miracle happened to honor the word of God. The message had nothing to do with miracles and wonders and healings. It was a message on the church. 
I'll tell you what. That kills the fallacy that some ministers are, are, are pretending to know today and say we cannot preach the message of the church and have results. You're wrong. You're wrong. Hallelujah. Because God has to honor His Word. There is something in the message of the church, hallelujah, that carries an authority and a power. Glory to God. That causes God to do wonders. Talk about Presho, South Dakota. A little independent church. Who was, they asked me to preach a Sunday night after the convention. And then, it was something, you know. I kind of thought some of the preachers were a little skeptical I might offend the people with the church message. But I went ahead and preached what the Lord gave me anyway. And I took that congregation through the Bible with the help and grace of God and preached a church message that when I was through, I wondered where I got all of that. I said to myself, I guess I preached everything I know I preached it in 30, what was it, about an hour and a half, I guess. <laughs> the pastor had asked me, Brother Garcia, it sure be good if you preach a, a divine healing message. The people, it would bless the people. And I said, is that what you want me to preach? He said, no, wait a minute, you preach what the Lord gives you to preach. And I said, all right. My brother Ham said, you preach what the Lord gives you to preach. And I'll preach what the Lord gave me to preach. Well, that night, in that service, they started, the Lord blessed so much. They loved that message. They just, uh, you know, they were not like we are. We, we say praise the Lord and glory to God. And they, all they did was cheer. But there was something marvelous in that congregation. And when we was over, oh, when this message was over, the Lord made this, this message come to an end with a manifestation of His presence. And the people came forth and we began to pray for them. There was a lady who had a blood clot. And we laid hands on her. And we just barely touched her forehead. And she fell out like she was dead. When she got out, she was praising God and shouting the victory. The Lord had healed her. Hallelujah. There was another lady who had something wrong with her eyes. I still don't know exactly what happened. But she was losing her vision. And when we touched her, I remember I saw Brother Ham reach up to anoint her and she was already gone. She laid out on that floor so hard I thought she would injure herself. But no, she, then, she just laid there for a minute and the Holy Ghost come on down upon her. And all she began, when she opened her eyes, her friends were hugging her and then she said, how do you feel? She said, I can see, I can see her eyes were healed. What I'm telling you is that this message has power. Glory to God. The message of the church of God has power to save, to sanctify, to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, to be healed by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. You don't need to apologize for this message. It is, if this message is from God. Some reason, some people are afraid to, to preach this message afraid to hold on to the traditions that have been handed down to us by word or by epistle I'm not talking about man-made traditions I'm not talking about cultural traditions I'm talking about the spiritual traditions that were handed down by the early church unto us traditions that we have no right to change The church must have steadfast leaders. It is imperative that we become concerned. The leadership must be spiritual and filled with a vision and divine revelation. This vision must be conveyed to those coming up. The reason why our former general over overseer in his last annual address emphasized the need to be rooted and grounded in the essence of how the church actually started and was now growing and functioning as God's church in the last days. That was the general overseer Bishop A.J. Tomlinson you can read this in Upon This Rock I quote I said 
to be rooted and grounded in the essence of how the church actually started and was now growing and functioning as God's church in the last days. I'm telling you, that's what, AJ, that's what Bishop M.A. Tomlinson was telling us that day in that meeting. He was actually telling us that we should be aware of our heritage and not to be ashamed of the church of God. Amen. We have nothing to be embarrassed about this holy church. Amen. The church is divine in origin, yes, yes. holy in nature, yes. and worldwide in scope. It is for everybody. Hallelujah. Yes. And we must preach it to everybody. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In the, in, the, in, the in the church today, we need strong, spirit-filled, and spirit-motivated leadership. It is imperative that we, that we under general appointment and general staff and the, and the state and national overseers alike assume our rightful and expected position as men, of, and men and women of God. Not men dedicated to management of an enterprise. Not the mastermind of some secular material gain for your state or country. No, but leaders who can inspire others, hallelujah, to greater heights in spirituality. I have heard of overseers who have taken and expressed their feelings saying that they are to take care of the business and they delegate the spiritual responsibilities to others, individuals or committees. Now this is wrong. The barometer by which a spiritual level is measured in, measured in any state or country and even here at headquarters is the top leadership. Did you hear me? If you're a spiritual leader, your people will be spiritual also. If you're a liberal person, your followers will be liberal also. You can say amen to all of this. But you, if you show indifference and, and apathy, Towards the spiritual things of the, of the church and the Bible, or the Bible and the church, then your people will also become negligent spiritually. Amen. It was A.J. Tomlinson who said that we can't rise above our leadership. Glory to God. It puts the fear of God in me. Bishop Van Dievender, it scares me to death. Oh, come on. I've been stopped up here as I walk. And people say, Bishop Garcia, we love you. Oh, Bishop Garcia, we have faith, confidence in you. Bishop Garcia, we know you're a man of God. And, I've put, and the fear of God settles in me. And I want to be that kind of a man. I want to be that kind of a leader in the church. I want to, I want to cause others. Hallelujah. To see and feel what I feel. Glory to God. I want the presence of God to be as real to you as it is to me. Amen. Oh God help us. Your enthusiasm. Your faith. Your zeal. Your vision. And your spiritual fire will spark others. By the same token. Your lack of it will extinguish that which might exist at the time of your appointment. Oh, I didn't hear too many amens, but that is a God truth. Oh, God help us. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't want to be appointed to something and then it go downhill instead of go uphill. I want God to bless me. I want a God to bless our ministries. I want God to use us. I want the signs to follow the believers. I want God. Hallelujah. I want God to do miracles and wonders in the church today. Oh, this is what we need today. The world today and its attractions keep getting stronger and stronger. The forces of evil are invading the heart of the church. If the leadership can be distracted and can be caused to be derelict in their duties, the devil will soon have won the battle. Sometimes the very thing that a man considers, considers needful to better serve the church becomes the very thing that injures, injures the church. Many of our spiritual leaders get themselves involved locally in so many social services that they have no time to visit the members. Others 
are studying in colleges and universities so that they can be more capable to serve. And the devil uses this pretext to take up your time that you should spend in your church visitation and ministry. Education is good, but not at the cost of losing souls and defrauding the congregations that support you. Oh God, my mouth is dry, my knees are weak, and I'm trembling before you in the presence of God. I'm not against education. I'm not against bettering ourselves. I'm not against that. But I am against the jeopardy of souls and the losing of our saints oh, and letting the devil enter and cause division and dissensions and the root of, 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 of that bitterness to come in. Oh, don't let that happen in the church of God. Oh, the church needs strong, faithful, and committed leadership. Um, in my own opinion, there are some things I think a, a person should have when God calls you. When He calls you, you must make a complete surrender, a positive decision. You should be an energetic person. And I mean like not, I don't believe God would call somebody who can sleep till noon and then have to take a nap at 3 o'clock. I believe God calls energetic people to His service. You must seek the spiritual conditioning of His work. In other words, you must be filled with the Spirit. You must put your total self into the work, including your personality and any talent. God knows that there are some talented people who get hung up on themselves and fail to give God the glory. You must be of incorruptible integrity. Oh, that's a high price quality of today. Integrity is the quality or state of being of sound moral principles, uprightness, honesty, and sincerity. And I need say no more on that. You must be a person of spiritual vision. You must be a person of victorious attitude, optimistic and confident. You must be firm in your convictions, firmly persuaded that nothing will separate you from the love of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Now in the church, if a person is called, and if he accepts the appointment, he must have divine revelation of God's holy church. Amen. Ephesians 3 and 3 says, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Yeah. I'll tell you what, you need to seek divine revelation. Amen. Two, faithfulness to all the Bible teachings. And you must have a personal adherence to the doctrine. You must live what you preach. Faithful obedience to those over you in the Lord. Theocracy applied to your life. It's all right when you are making the appointments. But it's now when it comes time for appointments to be made about you, that's terrible. Woo! Some people get terribly bitter. But I'm telling you, theocracy must be applied to our own lives. Holy life, void of worldliness. You must not love the world. Glory to God. The interest of the church must be foremost in your life. Hallelujah. I don't think anyone should ask, Come on, what's in it for me? You must have a good, clean testimony. And that's very important to the ministry of the church. The Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Hallelujah. You must be faithful to the covenant. You must... You must stand behind and support all that the church teaches and practices. There must be total loyalty to God's church. Hallelujah. This is something that is deep in my heart. I had to get this off of my heart and share with the church. I know it's late, but I'm about through. I tell you what, it's bothered me. I'm disturbed. 
I want our generations coming on to know about God's church. I want them to see men like there was men in the early church, like there was men of the pioneer church this side of the dark ages, like there may be men today in our midst. And I'm telling you something, I look around and some of the older folks, the older, the pioneer ministers are phasing out of the picture. Who do you think are the old men of the church today? Me and the likes of Elwood Matthews and a few others with some gray hair. Now we're, we're not, we don't look as old as we are, but praise God, I thank the Lord for that. But I'm telling you that I think this is expected of us. This is expected of us. We've got to work it. We've got to keep it going. And I don't mean this der derogatorily, Brother Matthews. I think it's an honor to grow old in the church of God and to give to God what we have. Hallelujah. What He's given us. I'm, I'm going to close with this scripture. In Proverbs 5.15, it says, Drink waters out of thine own cisterns and running waters out of thine own wells. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, this time that we resort to the church, glory to God, for what we need to keep us going, it's time to resort to the church for what we need to keep us going. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't think, glory to God, and I'll do respect to some of the writers, I don't think, I don't think that God's going to reveal anything more to people outside of the church than He will reveal to the church. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If he's got anything to tell us, he'll tell us through the church. Glory to God. I know how Lindsay's books are interesting and exciting, but when God's time comes to reveal about the end time things, he'll not call Hal Lindsay to come and counsel the church of the living God. He'll reveal it to the church. waters out of thine own cisterns and running waters out of thine own wells. Hallelujah. There's plenty of water to drink in the church of the living God. Hallelujah. Plenty of water. You don't have to be looking and searching and following men who don't even know anything about Christ's holy church. Hallelujah. And to close, and to close, Hallelujah. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. I'm closing. This is my conclusion. I have a woman sitting right there. Her name is June Garcia. Would you please stand, my honey? Stand. That's my wife. That's the wife of my youth. I love that woman with all my heart. I have a lot of respect and admiration and I think a lot about many other ladies. Some work in my office. I love those girls. They have become kind of like part of my family. But there's one lady who belongs to me and her name is June Garcia. No other can take her place. I, she cannot be replaced. And I don't have the right, hallelujah, to do, to look, to, 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 even, to even desire anything else but her. And I'm going to do what the Bible says. I am going to rejoice with the wife of my youth. Now I know that this scripture has a literal mini, mi, interpretation also. But it also has a spiritual interpretation. Now the wife of your youth is the church of God. You have entered into a covenant. Hallelujah. You have made a covenant. Isaiah 62 and 5 says, For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy son marry thee. Hallelujah. And when I raise my right hand and set it upon this holy Bible, and I covenanted with God in His church, that became the wife of my youth. 
Hallelujah. And I don't have any business looking for another. God. The church of God is enough for me. The church of God is enough for me. The church of God is enough for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to give her my total devotion. I want to give her my total attention. I want to give her my total love. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh God. Oh God. Oh God. Hallelujah. Listen to this one more scripture. Just one more scripture. And I'm getting ready to close. Malachi chapter 2. Glory to God. Verse 14 says, Yet say, yet ye say, Wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I don't care where you go. I don't care where you go. I don't care what you try. You have made a covenant. You will have covenant with God. Hallelujah. You might have dealt treacherously with the church of God. But I'll tell you what. You can come back tonight. You can come back tonight to the church of God. Hallelujah. And you'll find a faithful lady waiting for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let thy fountains be blessed. Glory to God. You want your local church to be blessed? You want your state to be blessed? We want the church in general to be blessed. Let your fountains be blessed. Glory to God. If you do, then be faithful. Glory to God to the wife of your youth. Be faithful to the church of the living God. Be faithful to the Bible church of God. Be faithful to the bride of Christ. Be, be faithful, hallelujah, to the church of the living God. Oh, God, I don't even know how to close this service. Oh, God. I feel the presence of the Lord in this house. I feel the presence of God in this house. Oh, hallelujah. How we need to come back. How we need to come back. How we need to come back. How we need to get close. How we need to know that lady, glory to God, that precious bride of Christ, glory to God, and be faithful unto her. Hallelujah. And not wander away. Oh, God. I don't know who wants to come to this altar. I don't want to imply that, that anything went wrong with you. But I do believe we need to make an altar and ask God to make us faithful to His glorious church. We need to make an altar and ask God to make us faithful to His glorious church. This is the church of the living God. Sing. Would you come? Would you come on? Would you come on? I was guilty with nothing to say. They were coming to take me.